Yo, Spencer Sakurai here. So I'm trying to make a feature film this year. I've actually been writing it for the past few weeks and a lot of this film takes place in vehicles. I thought this might be an efficient way to making a low budget indie film, but still kind of keep it exciting. You know, rather than having a bunch of locations and set pieces, I mean, it'll have a lot of set pieces for sure, but I'm trying to make like more than a third of the film take place in a car. That way it should just be a lot easier to film and keep things a lot more contained. Plus I've always had an interest in cars. I was really into cars in my you know my late teens and my 20s I've always had some sort of kind of sports car so I thought making a feature about something in a world that I actually knew a little bit about would be really helpful it's still gonna be kind of a horror thriller type film but with a little bit of a twist on it it's just gonna be a mixed genre film um, something that I don't think I've really seen before and I'm really excited to try to make it this year but when doing some research on this and thinking about the script I started thinking about how hard it is to actually film in cars at first I thought this was a really efficient idea to write a film inside cars but then I was like mm, I don't have a process trailer I don't have these kind of nice rigs in order to get those shots but then it reminded me of David Fincher David Fincher isn't a control freak and he's one of my favorite directors you probably know that if you're a longtime follower of the channel but if you've watched his films anything that he's basically done in the digital era he's used a blue screen on a stage to do his car shots he's done what's called the poor man's process trailer now obviously his isn't very poor man when we um, are looking at what he's got going on. But for what we're gonna be doing in this video, we're gonna be testing out the poor man's process trailer um, as an idea. But I'm gonna do it differently. I'm gonna do it more like David Fincher. And what that means is we're gonna use blue screen and background plates rather than using like rear projection or an LED wall or something like that. Obviously an LED wall isn't that conducive to lower budget stuff. Um, the last time I used one, I was able to make a deal in order to use one. But when I was budgeting out this feature film and actually looking at the LED walls again, at a full cost, mm, I just don't think it's gonna work for this. Plus, I don't know if LED walls are the way to go anyways. The volume technology is really cool, but what I don't like about it when you're actually using background plates, you know, to make it look as realistic as possible rather than using 3D environments, you don't have as much control as you would think. I wanna be able to change my exposure and my saturation and have full control over the background and maybe move the background forward or backwards in post. Anyways, we'll talk about more of that later in the video. But so for me, doing it the David Fincher way with blue screen just made the most sense for me. So that's what we're testing in today's video. I wanna do a quick and dirty test of shooting car plates and shooting interior car scenes using blue screen rather than attaching a camera to a car. Now in Hollywood, that's what you would do. You would use a, what's a real process trailer. It's basically taking your vehicle, putting it on a trailer, and someone else is driving the car around. That way your actors can act and do their lines and not have to worry about any damage. Dangerous. It's very dangerous to act and drive. I did a little bit of that in my last short film, Flea, and first off, it's really bad on audio, and it's just really hard for the actors to hit their marks, let alone when walking, and then translating that to driving. It's just it's really not the way to do it. Plus, in my film, I'm going to have all sorts of different types of vehicles, including drift cars. And I don't think my I should expect my actors to be able to drift, right? So all this stuff really just needs to happen on a stage, which doing it on a stage or doing it in an environment with blue screen and stuff like that is just kind of amazing anyways, because I'm going to be doing this with very little crew. This time I'm going to be probably doing it with maybe a crew of five tops. I'm going to try to make this as low budget as possible this time. And it's just going to be so convenient to be able to shoot maybe in an air conditioned environment and be able to just get the lines with clean audio and walk work things through with the actors and not have to worry about moving vehicles but that's all kind of hinging on this idea that i can do all this with blue screen on a stage so we're going to break down how i tested some of this out and i'm going to show you how i did it maybe this can help you next time with one of your projects so the first thing you're going to need obviously is a vehicle so for this i didn't have a stage to park my car on so i just used my backyard i've got a little concrete pad in the backyard um, and so i rolled my car back there and then i use one of my pop-up blue screens as a blue screen for the background. Now, this is only, I think, like a five foot pop-up blue screen. And ideally, you're gonna want the biggest blue screen possible. And I cannot emphasize this anymore. Now, buying a blue screen on B&H, like a nine foot 
backdrop is not that expensive. I would highly recommend buying a couple of those and doing that instead. But for this, I just was kind of a quick and dirty test. So I also had a bunch of Fernie pads or moving pads that were blue, very close to a chroma blue actually. So I put the main portion of my blue screen, you know, around where like the main keying had to happen. And then I overlapped my Fernie pads on the edges to get a little bit more blue so I could wrap farther around the car. And this actually worked out pretty well. I think it was obviously all proper blue screen, it would work a lot better. But for this test, this totally worked. But before we get too far into the actual setup of the car, let's talk about the background plates because they're one of the most important pieces to this whole puzzle. So you need to be able to film the a car in motion in order to replicate that in post when you're pulling in the plates as your background later. Now there's a few ways you can do this. First, I thought it would make sense to get the most stable plate possible and then add shake in later. Um, so me and my friend Drew, um, link to his YouTube down in the description below. We went out, we threw the red Komodo on a gimbal and we drove around the block to see how that would work. And it worked pretty well. I mean, the gimbal was stable, obviously, you know, kind of sitting on his lap as we drove to shoot plates as if they were coming from the same perspective as where I was gonna put the camera on our interior shots. But what happened is when you take a t turn or something like that, the gimbal doesn't really like that. It tries to stay in one place. And so the turns don't work out very well. And then sometimes your gimbal might wanna look up or down. So your horizon line kind of changes. Um, and what I found with that too, is that you don't get the micro jitters that you would get if you were actually driving, which yes, you could add those in post, but getting some of that um, on your background plate already really helps sell this effect. So I went out the next day and I decided to shoot this differently. Also, originally I thought using the, cause I've talked to some friends that shoot big car stuff. Thank you, John Carrington for some advice on this. I thought shooting on the same focal length for the background would also best sell the effect, right? You're gonna crop in the same focal length. And I tried that at first too, but that kind of limited me when I was doing my car shots and the interior car shots, because if I wanted to back up the camera a little bit or push in a little bit, I didn't have as much room in the background to work with. So when I went out the second day to get plates, I actually shot on a 24 millimeter rather than shooting on a 35 millimeter like I did before. I set the focus to about a meter away, which is roughly where the focus would be inside the car for most of the shot. Um, I shot at T28 to try to um, mimic what I was gonna be doing in the car, which was shooting around T2 or T28. And then if I wanted to add more blur in post, I could. And I wanted to do this, kind of send the background out of focus ahead of time to make it look as natural as possible. And I could always add a little more blur later. I think a lot of things say that you should probably just shoot as deep as possible and to do your blur in post, but I thought it would just probably look the most believable this way. And that's how David Fincher does it. He shoots his plates, I believe mostly out of focus. So I tried it this way and I, I like the results this way. Um, and so I'm probably gonna keep trying it like that. So I shot on the 24, that way I could crop in in post and move the image around and have more flexibility. And then I shot it stable as I could, but allowing those micro jitters to come through while driving. Now this works out well, because once you do get it in post, you can actually stabilize the footage, which takes out the, you know, the big bumps in the footage, but it leaves in a little bit of those micro jitters, which really sells the effect. I also found that, you know, shooting in a neighborhood or something like that, you have so much opportunity for parallax. It actually makes the footage look a little bit more confusing. It's a little bit harder to make it look accurate. So if you watch a show like Mindhunter, which is a David Fincher creation, they are in the car all the time in that show. And all of all of those car shots are fake. They're all done on a stage. Now they're using LED um, wall bits to add reflections on the car and stuff, which I wasn't able to do here, obviously. Um, but they're mostly using blue screen. And with that, you'll notice they're always like in the rural countryside and things are very far from them. The, the farther your background is from your subject, the more believable it is when you're doing these background plates. So I decided to go out on a little bit of a wider road to get this plate. That seemed to help a lot. The trees were farther away and just made it look a little bit more believable. That being said, I did also drive by some cars on this, but because I used that different focal length, it, for some reason, this one just felt better. Um, so the cars coming up pretty close to me actually helped sell the effect even more. It actually worked out that way. Okay, so that's how I'd recommend doing the plates. I think in an ideal world, which we should talk about the ideals as well in this video, the ideal thing would be 
to get an actual car mount and strap your camera to your car. Um, and so you get perfectly stable footage with the car, but also get those micro jitters. So when I film this for my actual movie, I'm definitely gonna try to use a car mount instead of doing it handheld like I did this time. But once again, this is just a quick and dirty test. So another trick John taught me was that you should, when you go to get your plates, film the driver driving while you're getting your plates because you can use the light coming in through the windows on the video as a reference for the actual plates. Um, now this isn't something you have to exactly replicate, but it is nice to have some sort of reference. So if you're going under a tree or something and the light fades away, when you shoot your interior shots, you can actually have the light fade away at the same time. This is all just gonna add to that believability. Say you're doing night shots and you're driving by like a red neon sign. Well, note that um, and then you can actually put up a little red during that section of the driving. So once the plates were done, then it was time to shoot the actual interior bits. And so to do this, I, like I said, I have my blue screen set up behind me. It's about six feet away. Um, I did this a few different times testing it out and I found that getting as far away from the blue screen as possible is definitely the key. Now I always say get the biggest blue screen and be more than 12 feet away, maybe 15, 20 feet away. So you have less spill coming at the car. Um, I was just using sunlight to do this. You know, obviously if you properly lit the green screen with proper lighting and even maybe adding a little bit of blue to your blue screen. Um, that's gonna make that key look a might be much more even and a lot easier. But for this, I was just using the sun. So because it was only like six feet from the car and I was using the sun, there was a lot of bounce coming back at me. But I was still able to get a pretty believable key out of this, even with those problems. But I highly recommend not doing it that way. And I will definitely be doing it with a bigger screen for my film. So next you're gonna wanna light your subject. So um, a lot of times on a process trailer, you'll have some sort of like sky panel or some sort of light in front of the windshield to just make sure there's constant elevation on your subject. Now, of course, this can act as your key light, but you don't want it just to be one harsh light the whole time because people will start to notice that, you know, that doesn't really happen in reality. So what I did was I took my um, Manlight 720B, I put a softbox on it, a nice four foot softbox. And I lit myself like that, which is kind of was believable. It's like kind of like the sun is there. It's a big circular source. It's not too soft, but it has enough punch to give us exposure inside the dark interior. And then to make it look like I was moving and the lights were changing, I switched over to the pulsing mode on the 720B. And I had it pulse about every four seconds from like a 30% to like a 100% brightness. So it kind of faded in and out as I was driving, which really helped sell the effect. Now, you, additionally, you could have someone be waving something in front of it, or you could have trees go by or something like that. So if you had more people to help you with this, you can add even more effects in the background, like, you know, have lights come in and out. These are all things that you can do to help sell that the car is moving. But for me, just doing it like this, you know, on a nice little close up, just having that one light pulse really was effective. Then on my first test, I didn't really have any more lights behind me, but on my second test, I decided to put a tube light in the background also with a pulse, just to add a little bit of glow in the background. You can barely notice it in the test, but it's enough to, like I said, help sell that movement effect happening with the car. And so this all comes down to control. Doing it this way gives you the most control possible when shooting cars. So before we get into the next section, I do wanna talk about this video's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to present your work online. You can start with one of their best-in-class templates or using Squarespace's next-generation web design system, Fluid Engine, you can customize every detail with the reimagined drag-and-drop technology for desktop or mobile. Or maybe you want to start an online store to sell your photography or other products. Squarespace has all the built-in functionality to get one of those up and running quickly. And I've actually been using Squarespace to run my online stores for almost a decade now. And of course, if you're like me, you're probably looking to build a portfolio, which Squarespace has a ton of features for that very thing. You can even create private galleries for client work using these tools. So if you're looking for a home for your work, well, you can just do that with Squarespace. Click the link in the description to get 10% off. And I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So when shooting the actual interior shots, another thing that I tried to avoid was shooting the mirrors or the side mirror because in post, you're gonna to have to go in and comp those out and put in another plate, which when you are doing your background plates, I would say in an ideal world, you would have multiple cameras shooting all at once while you drive your car around to get those plates. And that way you can have the back. So like if you wanted to turn the camera more, well, you could have a plate for that background or you can use that background, you know, 
child from behind the car to reflect in the mirrors. So for this purpose, since I was just doing a quick and dirty test, I just wanted to do one side play. And when I was framing, I just avoided the mirrors altogether. Now, in this scenario, you might want to sacrifice your composition a little bit in order to make the shot the most believable. And so just avoiding the mirrors altogether might be the move for that. But if you are gonna have a mirror in there, just make sure you have a plate to comp in later for the reflection in the mirror. So for this, I was using my red Komodo. Like I said, I ended up just using the Sigma 18 to 35 because it had autofocus for my interior plates and I needed the autofocus because I was filming by myself the second time I did this test. And then I ended up shooting in the high quality on the red Komodo. I talk about, I usually shoot on medium quality on the camera, but that's what the high quality is there for is getting the most resolution and color depth imaginable. Um, so the high quality is gonna really help you when you're doing um, visual effects stuff and you need more color information to key. And this did help me in the end. Um, I was using medium quality originally and it was getting really hard with the blue spill, but these are all things that can be mitigated later. You don't have to have such a high quality camera to do that for sure. You just need to control that blue spill coming in on your car. And the reason we use blue over green is mostly because the blue is gonna be a little bit more believable and easier to key. If you have a little bit of spill in the car, it's gonna be believable because you, the sun is already blue. Um, and if you do something like I did where I was shooting outside under trees, using green would be really hard because you probably have a lot more green coming in from those trees. And so when you go to key it out, you might start keying out spots of the vehicle that you don't wanna key out. But that brings us kind of into post. When you do get into post, you can always just mask around the windows when you're doing your key. And so you can um, worry less about some of that spill that's happening. I just took some of the blue spill that was inside the car and desaturated it later to make it look um, less like it was actually blue from a blue screen. So in post, it's pretty simple. You're just going to layer you know, your shots together. So you're gonna put your plates down first. What I did with those plates is I stabilized that plate. So it looked as smooth as possible, but still keeping those micro jitters, like I said before. And then I'm layering in the interior shots on top of that. And for me, I'm using DaVinci Resolve, but whatever keyer you're using, you know, I just selected the blue background and um, keyed that out the best I could. Obviously you'll have to finesse this for your key or the software that you're using. Doing chroma key work is its own video. So you'll probably have to, there's plenty of videos online to figure out how to do that part. Like I said, masking around was really helpful for me. Um, I messed up in a couple spots, so you'll see that it's not perfect, but for this quick test, I feel like it really sells. And then so for like processing it, I just made sure that I kept the background and the foreground Rec 709 to begin with. And I actually desaturated the background a little bit. Something about it being desaturated as if it's coming through windows or because it's farther away from the camera. I don't know, that just helps sell the effect for me as my base color. And then once you're done with all of your co compositions, you're able to compound the clip together and then color it as if you were coloring a raw clip, which also really helps sell the whole effect because then now you're adding color to a clip that is already acting as one. Something else you can do to really sell this effect is you can add some reflections to the windows. So I shot this with the windows up, hoping that some of those little reflections could come through, but in the end, I just keyed out the whole window. But what you can do is actually just take a little mask from like my, like for instance, in this shot, I have my arm up against the window. And if you look at that in reality, when the sun hits your arm, it's gonna reflect back at the window. And so I just took that shot, I mirrored it up you know, vertically. I just kind of flipped the image and then I used the screen effect and I lowered the opacity and I was able to basically make it look like my arm was reflecting off the window, which is another way of really helping to sell this, adding those reflections back in and stuff like that to make it look like you're interacting more with the environment. I'm sure you could throw a little dirt on the window or something like that as well to really sell it, but I'm no visual effects artist, so I'm not gonna get into any of that stuff today. This is more of a proof of concept for me going into the film, which will all later have help with when I go to do the actual post on the film. Something else you can do is at this point, you could add camera shakes. So once you've compounded your clips together and you have a new fresh clip, you can use like an effect like camera shake and add that in, which will then, you know, move the entire image, which does help sell like as if there's a camera shooting this, you know, in real life. The ideal way of doing this is actually to get your own tracking for these camera shakes. So you could put some trackers in the foreground and drive the car around um, and add a little shake like this to the camera. And then you could track that in later and add that data to your image, which would give you a more natural shake. But I was just using the built-in one in Resolve ended up not loving it, so I didn't use it on this main test that I keep showing you. But on one of these tests I did, which was, you know, like I said, I am gonna have drift cars in my film. So I had one little test where I kind of shifted the car and acted like it was more of an action scene. And I put in a pretty aggressive shake there and that really helped sell the 
car moving, like there's motion happening with the car, which all of this comes together, right? Like you have to do every piece of the puzzle to help make it look more believable. And with that is also adding some sound effects and timing everything out right that feels the most real. So if you put that shake in there, like when I shift the car, the sh it shakes, that's gonna add, make it more believable. Put a little music in there, a little sound effects. <laughs> and all of these things come together to trick the audience into thinking that it's real. Now, something I would recommend is make sure that you're always having extra shots to add context to these shots. If you hang on one of these too long, the audience's brain is smart, right? It's gonna start picking up on the fact that it's fake. Now, Hollywood does, the, does this all the time and we're pretty used to it. Geez, if you watch a Marvel movie, it pretty much all looks fake anyways. But for this, I want mine to look as realistic as possible and ground the film as much as I can. So what I'm gonna do is definitely be able to cut from the outside shots of a car just driving with a stunt double or whatever, and then cut back into these shots and also not hang on to them too long. I think it's important to make sure you're cutting back and getting coverage and moving around the car enough that the audience doesn't get too much time to really analyze the frame. To me, when I watch like Mindhunter and stuff, I never really pay attention to the car shots and that they're fake. But now that I've been going back and researching them more, I look at them, I'm like, wow, there's so many flaws in here. But I never noticed those when I was actually watching the show. So this is my version of the poor man's process trailer. I'm definitely going to be using some sort of stage with bigger blue screens. Um, and maybe even a few more lights and properly lighting the background and all that stuff and you know using multiple cameras for the for the plates and a car rig when I do this for my movie. But for a quick and dirty little test, I feel like this really sells using this. So like maybe you're shooting a commercial or something, and you only need like one quick shot in a car, but it's unsafe for the actor to drive. Well, this is definitely the way to do it. And what's gonna be great about this too is I feel like when I go to actually shoot the car scenes, I'm gonna be able to shoot so many scenes in such a short amount of time. Because if we're talking just a couple cars, you just roll one in, roll one out, change the lighting just a little bit, and then you're shooting. And it's probably gonna be the fastest way of doing any sort of setup that I would do in the film. And so I'm able to knock out those car scenes really fast, which is gonna be really great for my low budget that I'm gonna be working with when I make this film. Which stay tuned for that. There was obviously gonna be some behind the scenes content of me making that film. I'll be doing some sort of crowdfunding campaign here shortly, probably somewhere around the time I release Flea, which hopefully I'll be releasing that soon as well. So stay tuned for all of that. I'm excited to get that out in the world. But I think that's all I have for this video. If you have any questions about this test, Leave those comments down below. Until next time, guys, I'm Sensor Sakurai. See ya.